Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to go through uh, an introduction to vector search and graphs in, in, the, in the scope of that. And then Yuri is going to take us through into a lot more detail, uh, different graph algorithms, um, the kind of point behind them. Um, and then we're going to dive into, uh, I think, what, what Yuri is very well known for, which is HSW. Um, so we're going to go through all of this. Uh, we'll go through a lot more detail on the graph side of things, and then we'll have a little look at some practical advice when you are implementing these kind of things. Uh, and then we'll leave some time open at the end for Q and A. So uh, we'll go on to the next slide. So really, um, you know, starting right at the start. Um, so to describe very quickly, you know, what is vector search? So vector search, uh, you can think that it's a way for us to retrieve uh, relevant informa information in, uh, in a very intelligent and flexible way. Um, so it's the sort of thing that powers like Google search, Netflix recommendations, ads from like everywhere, like personalized ads. Um, Amazon product recommendations and like a, a ton of other things. Um, we can use vector search to retrieve and search through a lot of different things. So like you can use it for something called semantic search where you're searching for similar, um, similar sentences or paragraphs to particularly use a query. That's you know, kind of what you're doing when you do, when you use Google search. A Q and A, which kind of emulates the question answering um, style of, of people, um, and you can even search through, through images and even across like text and images and, and a whole ton of, of, of different things. Um, and of course, it's not restricted to just like search in this very basic sense. So you, as you can see here, there's also recommendations like ad recommendations, product recommendations, like a whole ton of, of different things. Um, so let's so the, let's make the search. Um, we move on to the next slide. Um, so in vector search, or the uh, I suppose the uh, simplest way of doing vector search is to exhaustively compare everything in a vector index. So a vector index is kind of like where you store all of your information that, or vector database. Um, compare everything in your vector database to your your query. Okay. And okay, that, that's fine if you have a, a relatively small data set. Okay. So you know if you have it, it depends on dimensionality of your vectors as well. So if you have like relatively normal dimensionality, maybe like around 700 dimensions um, and you have around a million vectors, you can sort of deal with this with an exhaustive search and it's not going to be too slow. Um, but then when you start getting to bigger data set sizes, it becomes either very inconvenient or just downright impossible. Um, and obviously most data sets nowadays are getting bigger and bigger. So it's um, exhaustive search works so far, but then after a certain point, we, we need to find something else. Um, so can we move on to the next slide? Um, and okay, in the previous example, we had one query. Like imagine if we had a thousand queries, um, that we, we increase the number of comparisons or different uh, computations that we need to perform there um, pretty significantly. Uh, so it, it very quickly becomes like, not scalable. So we move on to the next slide. Um, so as I said, right, um, exhaustive search doesn't scale. Uh, next slide. And that's where we kind of start looking for other alternative solutions. So we don't, or, or there, are, there are methods to allow us to kind of remove that problem or, or, or solve that problem uh, to an extent. And all those algorithms and methods kind of come under what is called approximate search or approximate nearest neighbor search. And uh, we can, I think we can, yeah, we move on to the next slide. 
So approximate search is essentially the approximation of the answer. So exhaustive search, we're comparing everything and we're getting the exact answer every time. Approximate search um, actually reduces the amount of computations that you're computations that you need to do or the amount of memory that you need uh, to perform your search by compressing or quantizing vectors, um, limiting your search scope, or doing a, a, a mix of all these things. Um, it's essentially finding a way uh, for us to um, more efficiently find an answer that is, is pretty close to perfect. Okay, it's not it's not always with approximate search, we're not guaranteed to have the exact like best answer every time, but we're we're guaranteed or we can be guaranteed to get pretty close. Um, and through approximate search, we're able to make search through large data sets uh, actually possible. Okay, we can we can actually scale approximate search. And we, we see people using approximate search in the sort of the one billion, 10 billion, even trillion uh, vector data set range. Okay, so it, it can get really big. Um, on to the next slide. So there are a lot of approximate search algorithms out there. So these are just pulled from ANM benchmark. Um, so these are using sort of pre deep learning data sets. So, um, you know, we, we'll see later on, we, we apply some of these algorithms to some um, some more recent data sets using deep learning methods. And we'll see um, that we get kind of similar results here, but I just want to point out that the, the uh, approximate search algorithms you see here, they perform um, differently on different data sets. Okay, so they're, they're never necessarily like a, a best um, algorithms to use. It's usually kind of like there's a few algorithms that you can use, and some of them will, will fall better on, on depending on your use case, depending on your data set, um, and a lot of other things. So, yeah, here you can see a ton of different things here, um, and generally near the top of all these benchmarks, you're going to find um, a lot of graph-based algorithms. Uh, but there are other things as well. So. Uh, we'll move on to the, the next slide. So yeah, th th there's a lot of different types of approximate search algorithms. Um, and they all fit into these categories. So we have uh, trees, hashes, and graphs. Um, so trees, you have things like binary search trees, hashes, uh, very well-known uh, version of this is the card sensitive hashing or LSH. Uh, and then graphs, I mean, that's what we're, we're going to take you through uh, today. So uh, next slide, please. So the general idea of a, a graph algorithm in approximate search is um, given, given a set of points, we're going to arrange them into a into a structure where we can navigate across that structure, navigate across the the links, and essentially what you're going to do is start your entry point. You're going to look at the neighbors of your your current node, and you're going to say, okay, which one of these neighbors is the closest to my my query? Okay, so that's what you can see, like highlighted yellow there, and you're going to move to that neighbor. Okay, and then and then you do the same again. So you say, okay, you know, which neighbor is the closest to my query? You move to that one, you do it again, and eventually you get to a point where there are no more neighbors that are closest to your query, and that's when you're at your your nearest uh, your nearest neighbor. That's where your your result. Um. So move on to the on to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so there are. Quite a few advantages of, of graph algorithms. Um, so, one one key advantage is that they are metric agnostic. So, what we mean by that is in um, in vector search and similarity search, you have all the different similarity metrics that you can use. 
Okay, you have like duck broad similarity, cosine similarity, equilibrium uh, distance. Uh, and then when you're looking at similarity search, you have things like um, Hamming and Lundstein distance. And with graph, you can actually use all of these different um, similarity metrics. And that's not the case, or, or it's not, it's, it's, not as, um, it's not as easy when it comes to different uh, types of algorithms. So like trees, for example, uh, they, they tend to perform very badly with different um, with different metrics and hashes, um, uh, oh, sorry, hash algorithms tend to be built for specific metrics. So you have to use a specific metric for each different um, hash algorithm. Um, so great, uh, graphs are good for this metric agnostic feature. Um, they use a local view. So uh, you're not, so every time you, you're adding data, you, you're not looking at the, the whole, um, the whole view of everything or when you're looking for nodes neighbors, you're looking at a local view compared to a specific node that you are, uh, that you're on. So that's good because it means when you're adding more data, uh, which you, you probably will with m many use cases, um, you're going to be more resistant to a, uh, distribution change, okay, um, which is good. It also means that you 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 won't need to train um, as you add more data, or you won't need to train as often as you would with, for example, something used quantization where you need to train a quantizer all the time. Um, another thing is that graphs are very fast and they have very good accuracy. Um, we we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, and. Um, so this is where I'm going to hand it over to Yuri. Um, he's going to go into a lot more detail on, on graph algorithms and HSW, um, starting with, with what you see here. So um, they can look at controlling the accuracy of your graph algorithm and actually scaling with n, e.g. The, the number of items that you have or number of vectors that you have within your index. So I will leave it to Yuri. Thank you, James. Yeah, so we'll go through the like we decompose the graph algorithm into like the way how the accuracy is controlled and uh, the way how we um, control the scaling. So going first with the accuracy. Uh, so like the primitive that is used to understand the accuracy in the graph algorithm that is uh, generally used is Delaunay graphs. So basically it's just a graph where nearest neighbor search uh, for one neighbor, uh, this greedy search always ends up in the correct result. So that is a, a useful model for, for what's happening. So for those who know uh, Delona triangulation, that is basically an extension of Delona triangulation to different spaces. And the uh, formula is defined uh, through the duality to Voronoi diagram. So uh, what is Voronoi diagram? Uh, so that is a partition of a space into nearest neighbor search solutions. So you can put it this way. Uh, so on the right, uh, you can see a, di a Voronoi diagram of a set of points. Uh, and uh, so like, let's say you're looking at the blue, uh, portion so on the left and uh, that basically if you put a, a query anywhere in the blue uh, portion it the nearest neighbor uh, like ne the nearest neighbor result of like querying this set of points will all be to be like the the, the position that mm, corresponds to the this point point of diagram. So basically, you just pre-compute uh, the nearest neighbor search solution for each of the points in your space. And the Zilona graph can be defined as uh, two points in the uh, set are connected if Voronoi regions of the points change when one of the points is removed from a set. Or like more visually, so if you have uh, two points uh, for which Voronoi regions are adjacent to each other, so they share a common border, so we need to connect them. And in this type of graph, uh, the 
greedy search is guaranteed to arrive at the exact nearest neighbor solution, uh, which is easy to check. So if you plant a query outside of the Varanoi region of your cell, it will always move on to a different cell. Uh, and that is both necessary and sufficient. So if we remove an edge as uh, depicted by like a dashed line here, so the absorbed Voronoi region of the center point changes because we don't see like the element in the bottom and uh, like it thinks that the Voronoi region, so the space of answers is extended. So if we place a query inside this delta uh, and try to search from the uh, center element, it will stuck because it thinks like it is the nearest neighbor of this, but it will always go away if the edge is present. So that is useful for understanding, uh, but uh, like those are not really used in practice. Uh, so it's more of a model and uh, like, the, like the biggest problem for at least Euclidean data is curse of dimensionality. So as this allows to search you for the exact nearest neighbor, uh, solution and all of those are suffer from curse of dimensionality. So it suffers also. And here it manifests that the average degree of the uh, Gelone graph is exponential, like at least on random data and uh, Euclidean spaces. The other problem is that it is impossible to build from points without knowledge of the space, which is a, it's a problem for uh, when you want to apply it to general metric. So basically, you don't know which uh, edge corresponds to uh, Delona graph. So, like, if you really want to, maybe you have to go with a fully connected graph. So you cannot deduce them. And uh, what's used in practice uh, is basically a Delona graph approximations, and it can be a result of direct op optimization of, say, like Voronoi uh, cell volume or a subgraph and Subgraphs are what are actually used in practice. Uh, so if you go to Wikipedia and see like what are the Gelone graph subgraphs, there will be like at least three of them. So that is Gabriel graph, uh, a relative neighborhood graph, and uh, one nearest neighbor graph. So Gabriel graph is, I think it's not that different from uh, Gelone graph itself. You have to have access to space. Uh, so it's not super useful. Uh, on the other hand, uh, on the other part of the spectrum, there is one nearest neighbor graph where you can uh, generalize it by k nearest neighbors. Uh, it was very popular for graph solution, graph based and then solutions for quite a while. Uh, but now most people use like variants of relative neighborhood graph, which is in the middle. And uh, the advantages of a uh, relative neighborhood graph, so yeah, it's, a, it's a subset of Gelone graph. So it uh, has a single connected component. So it's guaranteed to be connected. So which is not the case for K nearest neighbor or one near a neighbor, nearest neighbor. Also it's compatible with general spaces. So you just need the distances between your uh, set points to build this graph and uh, like how it's built. So it's uh, pretty simple. So there is a like a neighbor selection algorithm that is presented. Uh, first, you sort the candidates. So you, you have a, a, a base element in the middle and uh, you have candidates on which you want to decide whether to connect or not. And uh, for the full, uh, graph that is like all elements in your data set. So you sort them by distance and go one by one. So you connect to the first element because uh, like one nearest neighbors is always the subgraph. Uh, for the second element, you don't connect it because it is closer to uh, C1, which is already connected and is a closer element, so you don't connect. We also don't connect C3 for the same reason. And in the relative neighborhood graph, we uh, don't connect to C4. Uh, but there is a popular version of uh, RNG, which is denoted here by RNG star, which we actually connected. 
just because we don't connect to C3, and even though like C4 is closer to C3 than to the base, but since we didn't connect to C3, and C4 is uh, uh, further from C1 compared to base, I still connect to C4. Now, that's the difference. Yeah, and we always connect to C5 because it's further for all from all other elements. So what is the difference between this RNG star and uh, just RNG? And uh, yeah, basically RNG is a bit denser uh, and it works slightly better than RNG in practice. So maybe because it's, it is denser. Though the difference is not that big compared to K nearest neighbors. And what, it, what was curious for me at least uh, that this RNG star is not uh, Delaunay graph subset that is strictly uh, because here, like on an example on the right, the correct edge in the Delaunay graph might be to C3. Uh, it actually might block C4, but uh, we ignore that. Uh, but on the other hand, this RNG star is a Delaunay graph for a space uh, that consists only of data set items, which uh, was a bit confusing, but uh, like. The thing is, so Delaunay graph is not defined uniquely for a discrete point, uh, set, set points. So it might change as you add more points. And this RNG star is now very popular. And if you look at the history where it was used, uh, so it was used in rather old papers, for instance, like uh, by Aria and Mount, which is a, like a pretty old paper. So also used by uh, Gonzalo Navarra uh by harvard and uh, drummond uh, and all those papers they come up to it independently and i personally knew like this thing uh, from like uh, gonzalo navarro's paper and it's a part of hnsw and after those uh, uh this is now a standard uh, mm, selection algorithm for graph solutions which will use almost universally Going to the next part, that is graph search uh, scaling. So, like, what is the problem? Uh, so, like, if you just plot the graph on 2D and uh, start from, say, random point and uh, do greedy transversal towards the query, uh, well, it can be rather long. So, if you uh, like do the do 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 the expectation that is. Uh, uh power law like with the n which is a real problem in some applications uh and one of the ideas though it's not uh like the only thing that can be done is you can just add long connections uh to your graph so that uh when the greedy search comes it just skips some of them like and uh making uh, the scaling much better and there are plenty of works that try that. So uh, one of the works is the uh, work by Aria and Mount, uh, the same that use RNG star. Uh, so they come up with the algorithm with a log, log cube complexity based on like geometric flat graph. There was a famous work by Kleinberg, uh, which uh, studied navigable small world networks. Uh, I also have, uh, Polylogarithmic complexity log uh, n squared, and there was a, like our old work, uh, which is navigable small world model, uh, which is a bit different, so based on incremental automation with hubs, and uh, it had uh, also, but it also had uh, logarithm n squared complexity, and if you look at that, that doesn't look too good uh, because uh, like you know that trees can achieve logarithmic complexity uh, but the, so that those algorithms are doomed to lose that low dimensional data and uh, this also was supported by uh, empirical evidence so the, in the test done by uh, Leonid Weissoff and others uh, they saw that like the graph algorithms seriously underperform on uh, some data and like this reason is partly to blame and to understand like why, like where this uh, polylogarithmic uh, scaling comes from, I'll go a bit more in detail into NSW, so navigable small world algorithm. 
it's pretty simple. Uh, so basically, um, incrementally construct your graph by inserting your elements that, that are bidirectionally connected to uh, M nearest neighbors at that time. And uh, like in the end, uh, that makes those. So when you add the first elements, so uh, the distances between the nearest neighbors is pretty high. So they basically form this green uh, grid. And as uh, later elements are added, so it's more, more and more fine grained. And uh, well, you can show analytically and, and experimentally uh, that if you do greedy search in this graph, in this very simple construction, it, is, it has logarithmic scaling in terms of number of hopes. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that uh, average degree in the graph is uh, basically m or 2m, uh, so uh, the average degree of the nodes on which the greedy search actually go through and the search goes through hubs is logarithmic. And because uh, we have a uh, logarithmic uh, scalability of the degree on the path and the uh, logarithmic number of hops, you overall have the logarithmic, uh, polylogarithmic complexity. So log n by log n. And uh, that is a problem. And uh, so we found a way to solve it with hierarchical navigable small world graph. So basically, like we're using the ideas from. Uh, Solution for for trees, uh, like but in a different way. So basically, uh, what we did is we said that uh, you know that hubs uh, should like when you when you're routing through hubs, you don't need the connections that are uh, close. So and you don't need this log n factor. So if you can uh, somehow uh, uh, create a layered graph. On the top layer, you have like the long connections, and uh, going down, you have uh, the connection of smaller scale and smaller. Then you can uh, uh, route uh, the graph uh, in layers one by one, uh, having a kind of a fixed number of steps on each uh, layer, uh, and thus having a logarithmic uh, complexity. So you start from the top layer, you find the nearest neighbor on this layer, you go down, you find the nearest neighbor on the next layer, you go down and uh, like then there you reach your final uh, answers. And uh, like for those who know skip list, this is very similar to skip list, uh, but uh, we use proximity graphs instead of lists. So skip list is a very interesting structure. Like if you don't know it, I encourage you to read about it. Uh, and the thing is uh, this, uh, like the previously described 1D uh, navigable small world algorithm with uh, an RNG as a connection heuristic is very similar to skip leads in terms of degree distribution and link distribution if you merge all links uh, into a flat graph. So that is the motivation. And uh, the graph is constructed also like similarly to skip list and NSW. So it's based on incremental construction. Uh, so when you, uh, but now when you add a new element, uh, you also select randomly a maximum layer to add it uh, and add it to each of the uh, layer. Uh, an insertion is done by RNG star, which was described in, uh, in previous sections and uh, well, the connections are also pruned by RNG star. So what's good about that? So, uh, so you can achieve logarithmic scaling uh, with this uh, construction solution and search. At the same time, you don't have any backtracking, which is a problem and maybe like the main reasons why three algorithms don't perform well. So it allows you to like use basically the same algorithms for uh, most of the data sets, which is very handy and useful. Still, we have uh, this uh, feature that uh, it works with any distance function, so it doesn't even have to be metric. And yeah, it's still fully dynamic and massively parallel in a sense that you can 
insert elements, uh, delete them, uh, and updates, and that requires only a local view and can be done like in so uh, in, in hundreds of runs in, in parallel. Yeah, so now I'm going to talk about some newer works which happened after HNSW, uh, and that is like in memory, specifically in memory constraint scenarios, which is um, useful for many applications. So basically, uh, what's the problem with uh, graph algorithms? Uh, like the major component is sometimes the data is too big, so it cannot fit in RAM. Uh, because uh, when you compute the distances, you, you need to have uh, all your elements uh, accessible when you compute it. And uh, well, there are uh, well-known solutions, uh, well, uh, like maybe classical solutions uh, uh, based on compression for that particular problem. And uh, like we can use some of them. So what are the possible solutions? So first is compress uh, and or quantize the data. So that way you reduce the size uh, of your vectors and uh, well, basically allow to uh, do comparison with them. Uh, but yeah, that, that affects the uh, recall negatively quite a while. Mm, and uh, this, the other is to use graph algorithm as the coarse quantizer or uh, IVF PQ, which I'll uh, discuss a bit later. And uh, like another solution is use external memory, like disk. So if you cannot fit uh, your data into RAM, uh, so maybe like you can just uh, look it up what you need on, on a disk. So uh, going to the cost quantizer solution. Uh, so uh, IVF uh, PQ is basically based on selection of uh, the clustering the data, uh, and uh, like during search, like you uh, select the promising clusters uh, that are close to query and uh, uh, do, do something like a brute force of quantized data inside the cells. Uh, and uh, like the first step of IVS was typically uh, a brute force of the clusters. Uh, and uh, because the brute force is linear with the size of the data set, uh, which limits the number of clusters. But the idea is that you can use uh, another ANM like HNSW to uh, speed up the uh, search for the closest clusters. So and now instead of like you partition space to say 10K clusters, you can partition your space to 1 million clusters or 10 million clusters uh, and uh, like as much as you can get into memory. Uh, and then you can efficiently, uh, more, more like fine greenly select the candidates. So you will need to look at less class, uh, less elements and uh, like gain better efficient, efficiency. And uh, with additional tricks, uh, so there are like way, way tricks and hacks how to reduce the memory consumption. Uh, as far as I know, this uh, solution in general is still uh, the state of the art in memory limited scenarios uh, and, and typically works better than a full graph on product quantized data. Also because, well, you don't need to spend memory that much, much memory on links. So another solution I want to discuss is uh, disk ANN that I think is used in Microsoft. Uh, so the it uses a different construction algorithm, uh, which is different from NSW, NSW, which is based on an and descent. And so it's a, uh, so that is a static algorithm. So it assumes that you have all your data set in advance. And uh, like it, it's also pretty useful in some scenarios. So you basically start with a random graph and do update iterations, which refine the graph. Uh, and after some iterations, you will end up in a like nicely, uh, in, in a nice proximity graph uh, based on like what criteria you do optimize. You can optimize for nearest neighbors or using like similar heuristics like RNG. Uh, yeah, and this KNN uh, is using that, so it's different from HNSW. And uh, 
like but the like the main the main difference of disk KNN so that it uh, it uses disk uh, so it still uses compressors vectors on memory uh, which has uh, some errors in approximation so it's not uh, fully accurate but uh, after the comparison stage uh, they fetch the uh, the full vectors and uh, that is collocated with links uh, so they uh, refine the distance between the elements and also uh, continue uh, traversing the graph and this collocation idea is uh, i think pretty interesting so you can use disk and uh, traverse the graph with few lookups uh, also this kind of uses a relaxed version of rng star heuristic uh, which is different a bit from other papers, but I don't think that like it affects the results that much. Um, yeah, in general, it performs better to high compression random resolution, uh, especially the high recall. Well, just because uh, like in RAM only solutions, uh, there is a cap on the maximum recall. So because you compress the vectors and you cannot refine them, so like it will always perform worse. Uh, at high recall. Uh, so there is an alternative solution uh, to like to how to store elements on disks. So uh, here like can reference to spawn paper, but I, like as I see it is pretty different, pretty similar to IVF HNSW, uh, which is on memory, but instead of product quantization, you basically store the elements on disk. So you have a, so you have the same IVF with, with a, a fast course quantizer, uh, and uh, so according to Spawn paper, it generally performs better than this kind of. And uh, yeah, also worth mentioning that uh, Vespa has a similar solution based on HNSW. Uh, okay. So on the last part that I wanted to go through is uh, like updates in deletions and graph, which are important to some practical applications. Uh, and the problem uh, with updates and deletions uh, is that basically you need to rewire the graph after you, you, you remove or update your element. And here, I, I, like I, have, I copied a, 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 a figure from the, the paper uh oh that's the only number two not one so with some strategies uh on what to do with uh with the other uh vertices in the graph and basically uh so there are some possible strategies on how to select the new neighbors from uh your connections of your element uh so and i call those like one hop because those are one hop from uh, the base that deleted element but tests show that like even from this paper uh, that if you do that and update your elements uh, your quality degrades over time with the number of iterations so on the right they evaluate a different update strategy with uh, oh, with uh, like random protocol uh, and uh, so they plot uh, relative queries per second at fixed recall. So the recall is fixed, and to get the same recall after 10 iterations of removal and insertion of elements, uh, so you need to uh, like you need to spend more time searching for that. And uh, here I just wanted to know that HNSW lib, which is uh, the library that I support has a different rule for updates and uh, like I think most people don't know that it actually has uh, like dynamic updates uh, and it uses different two hop rule uh, so it, it doesn't have deletions and uh, the reason why it doesn't have deletions is that updates are very similar like in very similar to deletions only uh, difference between deletions that deletions can actually shrink memory but if you have a constant uh, flux of new element that uh, basically and all elements get removed so you can just like update all elements to new 
and the like the major bonus of why like uh, updates uh, like we used updates is that you don't need a reverse graphs that reverse graph that are used uh, in other works. So basically, so when you remove an element, there are some element that point to your deleted element. And uh, those are hard to discover locally. So you have to have a specific structure that basically in indices all elements that uh, point to your, to your element, or you have to like ignore them during search with uh, causes performance problems. And uh, like to hop, uh, what's the difference is basically, so when you delete an element and you want to decide uh, like what's the updated, mm, so, so how to update the connections, you do an additional uh, hop in the graph to enrich your uh, candidates, which is kind of similar to what N and Descent is using for, for building the graph. And that basically allows to bootstrap the graph and uh, like at least in our test, what we saw is like there is no degradation of performance uh, with the iterations. So it degrades uh, on the first iteration a bit, but then it's like it's super stable. But at the same time, it's more expensive. So if you compare to other solutions for uh, delete, because it requires two hop. But if you like really want to have a stable performance with uh, updates, so like you can use HNSW leap. So it is already available and has been there for a while. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's it for my part. Uh, James, can you take over? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Yuri. Uh, super interesting. So uh, for, the, for the last last uh, part of the presentation, so we'll go through like um, some practical advice if you if you're looking to implement. Um, a graph algorithm like HNSW or you know, actually HSW. Um, so we we'll go on to the on to the next slide. So uh, the, the first thing is in in a lot of cases or in, in some cases when you particularly when you have a, a small data set, uh, you, you can actually just do an exhaustive search like we, we mentioned right at the start where you're just comparing everything. So a brute force just compare everything that does work um, and as, as well as that you can also use your um, use a GPU for approximate search or even or exhaustive search to speed things up um, a lot um, and you can do that on you know I think most or if not all of the popular libraries um, for these um, next slide please So uh, we saw earlier at the start, there were a couple of benchmarks and we mentioned that these are sort of pre-deep learning. Um, so they're using uh, things like the, the glove data set. Um, so we wanted to, to show just a few um, that are more recent. So uh, the squad data set is the standard question answering data set. And uh, here we've used a, uh, an MPNet sentence transformer to create the embeddings. And we just test it on a few uh, a few different indexes. So a couple of you the recognize from before. And these are done very quickly. Um, so the, the results can definitely change depending on sort of the parameters that you're using as, as you already mentioned before. Um, so yeah, just just be be aware of that. Um, but we can see like HSW is is one of the top performers here. Um, and you can also see IVF HSW. Um, so basically everything that is like um, towards the right and higher is, is better. Okay, so um, towards the right, you have better recall and higher up you have queries. That's basically how many queries you're able to do every, every second. That's obviously higher recall and QPS is, is what in most cases you're going to be looking for. Um, but of course, some some um, use cases you might be happier with a, a low recall and high TPS or a low TPS and high recall. Um, so that's squad, which is it's a, it's not it's not a massive data set, maybe like eighty k. Um, but we also have MS marker. So go on to the next slide. 
So uh, in this benchmark, we used 8.8 .8 million um, vectors and we queried with 6.8 thousand query vectors. Um, so there's there's quite quite a lot going on there. And uh, you can see, again, HSW um, is pretty good performance. Again, you, you should assist yourself on your own data set and, and sort of play around uh, with the add parameters um, a bit more. So um, on, to the, on to the next slide. So beyond you know what we what we've just seen there, um, in terms of just generic practical advice, um, always read the doc to your specific like algorithm, um, and most of them you're you're going to find very specific guidance and high parameters that you can that you can tune, um, and tuning high parameters is, is pretty much the way you want to go, no matter which algorithm you're using. So. Uh, with your specific use case or data set, you know, get your algorithm or a few algorithms, tune the hyperparameters, and and see what sort of performance you can get. So, um, specifically with you know what we have here for HSW, um, there are three hyperparameters that you're going to want to do, uh, which is M, EF search, and EF restriction. Okay, so M is sort of the like it's memory related and it's the Optimal value for the speed depends on like the internal dimensionality of your data set, um, but but for the most part, the, the default value of M uh, of 24 is, is going to work fine. Uh, ES search is something that you can adjust um, after you've constructed the the index. Uh, so this is a really good one to just modify, um, perform a search, see how it performs, modify again, then perform a search, just keep doing that until you get this. Same, the right sort of uh, recall versus for the second that you, you are looking for. Um, and then EF constriction is a another parameter that you have to set when you're constructing the graph. So this is uh, this is going to a higher EF constriction is going to increase the construction time, uh, but it's, it's going to optimize your graph um, so you, you'll get that query time. Um, and one sort of useful tip on on finding the right EF constriction value is um, by using a, a, a using a set or variation of EF search values and find which EF search value returns the recall that you need, right? And then use that value in your initial EF construction and you re, uh, rebuild the graph. Um, and then and then we have just a few other here. So IVF. Um, we saw that, and you can use HSW and IVF together. So you actually use all of these. Uh, so you have NPro and then list there, um, and then scan. Uh, the, you know, it, we don't know so much about the the different. There's a lot of parameters in scan, um, and a lot more than what you can see here. But uh, you can sort of get started with the whether it's in mem whether the effect is being stored in memory or not, and the um, number of links that you're searching through. Um, so yeah, I think that is you know, let's that's that's it on the practical advice, and we can move on to the next slide. Um so we'll list a few links on here that, that you might find useful. Um and we'll we'll just move on to the onto the QA. We have we have eight minutes to go through that. Um so we'll we'll take a look, we'll take any if you have any questions that you haven't asked already. Uh, please just put them in the Q and A box, and we'll we'll get around to them. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with the, the the first question that we had. Um, so we had a couple of questions here. Um, the first one from Julian, uh, which was when are you when are you going to release HSW on uh, Pinecone? And so on Pinecone, we released the graph based index last month. Um, which is a P2 part, and you can, you can Google that and you'll find some information on it. Um, that isn't HSW, but Pinecone's own flavor of graph based index, uh, which includes filtering and real time and partial updates. Um, and then the next question after that is from Avinash. So, um, so my corpus just contains 
3000 sentences and fits well in RAM. Previously, I tried Annoy and Spice L2. I haven't noticed much of change and have never looked back on ANN algorithms. However, do you believe that attempting these advanced patient safety algorithms will be beneficial? Um, and what would you recommend for such a little corpus? Um, you can take this if you like, Yuri, otherwise I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, you, I haven't uh, heard, so what's the data set? Um, so they have a, a pretty small data set of 3,000 sentences. Um, and oh. I, I think they, they've been going through and doing an exhaustive study through this, seeing it at work. Um, and when trying with a project in the nearest neighbor study, they, they saw it didn't work. Uh, or it, it didn't provide any benefit. Well, yeah, so that, that makes sense. So in uh, like a service solutions for nearest neighbor search, so usually like there is a, some threshold until you, you do, before that you do like an exhaustive search. So like uh, the, the, the methods, uh, and methods offer better scaling, but on smaller sizes, they are as good as exhaustive search. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you basically you want you want probably want a, a larger data set before you start using A and N. Um, and what yeah. you're doing now with your exhaustive search is probably more than enough for for what you have there. Um, yeah. So the next question from from Vicky is: uh, We heard a lot about the advantages of graph algorithms. Um, what are some of the trade offs to consider when using graph? Uh, are you gaining something? What do you lose when you use them? Uh, like between graph algorithms or uh, graph algorithms and others? No, I think I think the the question is what are the disadvantages of graph algorithms or the trade offs? Uh, so that depends on like what is the other algorithms. Uh, so like I think that. Like with proper development, you can uh, use uh, the graph algorithm for any solution. So usually it's just like a graph algorithm is a part. Uh, so there are solutions uh, specific that work better sometimes, uh, for instance, for sparse data. So uh, there are some special solutions. And uh, if you don't adapt graph solutions to them, like graph solutions would underperform. Uh, so there are, if you look at the libraries, uh, so some um, libraries based on quantization, so for instance, scan sometimes work better uh, than graph algorithms uh, for like cosine or uh, L2. Uh, so if you are using uh, cosine or, or, or L2, you don't want to have like different spaces, um, then you might also look at them and test like what works better in your use case uh, but it's a uh, so it's hard, hard hard to predict uh which would work better without knowing like internal dimensionality of the data set the size of the data set so it's just easier to advise just to try them out and see what works better in the use case okay cool thanks you um so we have one one other question from Rahel in the in the chat, and we have another question after that as well. Um, so it's Pinecone open source proprietary, and what does Manage get you? So Pinecone is proprietary, and uh, Manage is so all of your infrastructure, uh, things like filtering, keeping track of the metadata and, and vectors in your in your database is all handled on Pinecone side. So uh, it's basically like you three lines of code and you have a, a, a massive vector database that you can use and, and scale up to like billions or, or, or larger um, data sets. Um, oh, and there's also a free tier as well. So you can, I think you have up to 5 million vectors for free. Um, so you can go ahead and, and try that as well. Um, so another question here from Richie is, uh, what is the size of a data set that a brutal force search is as good as approximate neighbor's neighbor search? Can you say that, Yuri? Uh, can you please repeat? So it wasn't. Uh, yeah, no worries. Um, 
Sure. What is the size of data set that a brutal force search is as good as approximate search? Uh, well, that depends a lot on internal dimensionality of the data. So if your dimensionality is low, and well, it's, it's hard to tell without like looking at the exact data, it will like be, so the approximate nearest neighbor search will become quicker, much faster. So I think uh, like the, the rule of thumb that people are used is something like from 10K to 100K. So that really depends on dimensionality. So from some extremely high dimensional data sets, uh, like even you won't see again, even from a million. So that, that depends. You need to experiment. Okay, cool. Thank you, Yuri. Um, Alan asked, are there, are there any solutions to using HSW with product quantization when data is being updated from time to time? Uh, well, there are solutions uh, based on IVF. Like, uh, well, I, I'm not sure. So I'm not sure where the updates are implemented. That is possible if uh, your data distribution doesn't change because you need to train the product quantizer on your data. So if your data doesn't change, then in theory, that is possible to do updates. Uh, though I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe those are implemented in, in phase, but uh, I, I don't know, like, like you can look at phase and see if it's implemented. Cool, thank you. And we're just one, one last question quickly and we'll, we'll sign up. So from Pablo, um, is it easy to make these algorithms work in practice for hybrid search? Uh, the vectors have attributes used for filtering, um, and it's referring to the creation of a unique vector that combines all information. So basically, I think approximate search in hybrid search is that is it easy to do? Uh, well, if uh, you want to filter by attributes, so that is. That, that is doable. So there are some published work like by some companies that do search. So we, they do search and uh, graph algorithms. Uh, like, I mean, filtering plus graph algorithms. So for instance, V8 uh, has some works at uh, uh, Quadrant, I think Vespa. So, uh, so there are levels of difficulties there. So the easiest solution is just to ignore uh, the elements that don't pass the filter during the search. Great. Uh, thank you, Yuri. So uh, that's all the questions. So we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, with the, if you're looking for the recording, if you join later or whatever, you can, you'll find that on the Pinecone uh, YouTube channel. And we'll send it out in a email after this. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll send you the presentation. So all the links that you see here, uh, you'll be able to I go into that and, and find those. So thank you very much for joining us, Yuri. Uh, it's super interesting. And thank you everyone else for listening in. Bye. Thank you.